the next insight or maybe I should say not insight is called the ten imperfections of insight and I and that is actually from the Visuddhimagga from the commentary it's not from the Buddha and I think and I'm going to mention it because the question has come up and the question has been in my mind too why there seems to be such a secrecy and such a difficulty in getting near to the jhanas and this I think is where it comes from from the misunderstanding of this particular aspect of the commentary uh, in fact I'm pretty sure that's where it comes from because the Burmese school uses the commentary very strongly and um, that's really where this whole thing comes from so there are ten things mentioned as imperfections of insight and I'll just read those ten huh? illumination which means bright light knowledge rapturous happiness piti calmness prasadi bliss sukha faith Adimokha, energy, Pagaha, assurance, also mindfulness, equanimity, Upeka, and attachment. Now, out of those ten, eight are factors of enlightenment. So, obviously, there's a misunderstanding somewhere, and it's quite clear what that misunderstanding is and it says here that if a meditator thinks that the illumination the light or any of the others are a sign of some super mundane attainment then that is conceit and with that conceit arises the attachment this is my attainment and uh, and it says even my teacher does not possess such an attainment and if one conceives any of these experiences to be of the super mundane stage then one is holding wrong view so what is happening here is what is being explained is the um, are actually eight uh, sorry uh, six of the um, seven factors of enlightenment there are seven factors of enlightenment and six of them are contained in these ten and the factors of enlightenment are PT well, everybody knows now what PT is don't they calm uh, bliss sukha calmness prasadi equanimity upeka energy pagaha energy is also one of the factors and of course mindfulness now mindfulness is not mentioned here as such it's as mentioned as assurance but what is mentioned is that because the mindfulness becomes very um, very easy and uh, the mindfulness becomes quite automatic an inner assurance arises and with that inner assurance then this that's why this is called effortless awareness with that this assurance arises and that's why it's called assurance here but mindfulness is the first of the seven factors of enlightenment so we can see that there's a bit of a difficulty has arisen here somewhere along the line between what the Buddha said and between what the commentators say so what is actually the, the, the reality of this is that if one has first, second, third or fourth jhana 
which all contain pity and sukha, joy, and the calmness of the third one, and then the equanimity of the fourth one, which is more the peacefulness. One has any of those and believes to be enlightened, one is, of course, on the wrong path. Nowhere does it say that one shouldn't have them. And this is where the misunderstanding has come in. And this is why, probably, there's always this warning about getting attached. And what the commentary says is, the subtle imperfection of insight called attachment is one which is latent in all other imperfections. The unskillful meditator conceives a subtle attachment to his insight which is adorned with such marvelous things as those ten. And thus he is carried away by craving conceit and view. Well, craving to have it again, conceit it's mine, and view I'm enlightened. Well, if anybody is thinking that, please stop it right away. <laughs> so, and again and again it says that the teacher is there to tell that this is not so. But it doesn't say that the teacher is to say not to do this. It always says that the teacher is there to say that this is not enlightenment. The jhanas are mundane. They are not super mundane. There's no question about it. All eight us are mundane. And all the benefits that we get from them, I've already explained. I don't have to go through that again. But this is important, I think, to because of this um, dichotomy of understanding which is in existence, particularly it appears in, um, well, maybe, I don't know, all of America or California or wherever, it's uh, particularly uh, latent. Um, this is probably where it all comes from. They are called the ten imperfections of insight. Now, the imperfection of insight is a very strong word because it appears, it sounds, as if you, if you don't bypass those ten things, then you are having imperfect insight. Well, what it really means is, what it really says here is, well, one of them is faith. Well, faith is one of the five spiritual faculties which turn into the five spiritual powers, which are ten of the 37 factors of enlightenment. I suppose in order to understand this whole business, one does have to know what the Buddha said. And uh, it does help. So, with having these factors within one there is very little chance of, of believing that one is enlightened because the minute any of this disappears there's dukkha again nobody can get away from it so it is a matter of not it's not an imperfection of insight. These are not directed towards insight. They are directed towards calm. So of course they don't bring insight. But any skillful meditator, and I've explained all that already, can, through that calm, not only have a mind which is strong and um, untroubled, imperturbable but also get from those states in the jhanas tremendous insight which I've already explained already that what kind of insight we get particularly from joy for instance we know that this is a kind of joy that isn't available out there so we don't have to run after it this is I have explained all those benefits already so all of these that are mentioned here are particularly geared towards calm. Mindfulness can be geared towards anything, but the assurance which is mentioned as an um, outcome of spontaneous mindfulness, that again brings calm. The, the one which is maybe of interest is the one called knowledge. 
It's quite an interesting one. A meditator gains remarkable insight into the meaning of canonical statements, doctrinal points, and significant terms. Whatever words in the Dhamma he reflects on now reveal to him a depth of meaning he had never previously seen in them. He mistakes this for discriminative wisdom and interpreting it as a super, super mundane quality becomes enthusiastic in preaching. <laughs> as a result, his meditation suffers a setback. This is the imperfection of insight called knowledge. The skillful meditator discerns craving, conceit, and views underlying this imperfection. Uh, craving to do something with it and the conceit, I am somebody, I've got all this wonderful knowledge and the view that this is enlightenment. So the, the um, important point of all this is that jhanas do not mean enlightenment, but they certainly lead there according to the Buddha's pathway as we can see from the uh, sutta which I've been using, that the commentary has a kind of wording which is it's translated into the best way that it can be done, but language keeps changing all the time. And because the, uh, the language that was used may not have had the exact meaning, because when we read ten imperfections of in insight, of course the result from that can easily be seen that that would be a no-no. Turn away from it. Don't do it. And yet, it's very important to see that six of the seven factors of enlightenment are here within those ten. So when those six of the seven factors of enlightenment and the only one which is missing is the investigation into phenomena which could possibly be this knowledge one because the investigation we do would be would bring a deeper meaning to everything so the only thing that one needs to know is that without a past moment there is no enlightenment it would be so simple so I think this is where the whole um, difficulty has arisen from. I have not asked anybody, I, ha I don't know anybody but that, you know, has said anything like this, but I have been told over and over again that people do not teach the jhanas and say that they're not, not um, desirable, and I think that's where it comes from. And this is the Burmese path. This pathway that is described in here is the Burmese pathway. But in the beginning it also contains the jhanas because it is from my teacher who was taught in the Burmese way but did the jhanas anyway. And he, if you remember it was already mentioned here that the suppression of the defilement through the jhanas is more effective than trying to do the substitution with opposites. Well, the best thing is to do both, no? So I thought this was an interesting aspect because it's in here. It is also a, um, a step on the inside path according to this. I have never, I never usually talk about this because the only time this question comes up has been here in California. In other countries it's not that uh, urgent, you know. So um, I never use it as a step on inside because obviously it's a non-inside. So it doesn't help us much. But it is interesting to, to find that. And um, the word which is meant, the, the path and the not path, it's then called. And then one should do well to follow the advice of one's teacher, it says. Um, all the imperfections have a subtle trace of attachment hidden beneath them, and thus they will deflect one from the right path. They only have this attachment if we allow it. And as I said already once before, it's better than being attached to sex, I can assure you. <laughs> so, 
and I'm sure you know what I'm referring to. So uh, it's uh, naturally, if we're attached to any particular state of mind, we can't go on and get further. Whatever I'm attached to, that's what I'm stuck to. Being attached means being stuck or glued to something. And uh, if I'm attached to this pillow, to sitting on this pillow, I'm afraid I will have to sit here all the time. I can't do anything. So it is the same with one's love. When love is attached, we can't love because we're stuck. And it's the same with if we are attached to any of the states which arise in the jhanas, then we can't go any further. But the interesting aspect of that is, and I've been teaching this for years on end now, in Asia and in, in the West, that while there is a danger of that in Asia, I have never ever experienced with any of the meditators a real danger in the West. Not ever. All of the meditators in the West that can do them always want to go further. And in the East, and particularly in Sri Lanka, where I've been teaching for many years, with the um, Sri Lankan uh, meditators, there was very often a real getting stuck. Because they do not have the background that we have of intellectual inquiry. We get this intellectual inquiry taught to us from kindergarten on. In fact, if we have sensible parents, they will say to us, well, don't ask, think. And as we are told that, we will probably start thinking. And we go through doing that from kindergarten through to college and even further. It's an intellectual inquiry which is very um, normal for us. So for Westerners, it's much more difficult to become calm. And for Easterners, it's much more difficult to gain insight. So this is where all this warning comes from. It all comes from the East. And now it's been taken completely, all kit and caboodle, the whole lot of it, into the West. <laughs> and one stops good meditators from being able to enjoy themselves. So I'm pretty sure that this is where this difficulty has arisen from and that's why I'm mentioning it because also the question has come up, Michael asked the question, and the question has come up over and over again here in North America. It's um, in other places, I don't recall whether it came up or not, I'm not sure. So after all this, we can go on with our insight. Huh? Now the next thing that we come to is called the purification by knowledge and vision of the way. Because this one is of course the, the way and the not way are the path and the not path. So now we come to the knowledge and vision of the way. What's the way? But these are only titles. And uh, it's divided, first of all, into three parts. The first part is called full understanding as the known. Now this very first part, that which is known to us, which we do not have to um, try and find, it's known. These are the first three insights which we have already discussed. The first one, mind and body, second one, arising and ceasing, and third one, cause and condition. Now that's known, we can see it. There's no real difficulty in having an understanding of that, even though it may only be intellectual. The intellectual understanding is the first step. Without that, of course, we don't understand anything. But it needs to come, become an inner reality that this is so. But this is not the very first step. So the very first step of those three insights is to know it. That's all. Just to know it. 
That means to put one's mind to it. Once one puts one's mind in that direction, there's no difficulty in knowing it. And the second one is a full understanding of the investigation. Now, the investigation was the next one of the insights. That was investigating the three characteristics again and again and again. Anicca Dukkanata. Finding it again and again. Now, it says actually that this can become, um, that one may feel that this is um, a chore or that it's tedious or even that it is saddening. But it brings about the greatest happiness once one has seen it. Because none of the things which ever can bother us are meaningful. All is anicca dukkhanata, the whole lot. So that investigation done over and over again must eventually yield fruit and we come to that fruit as we go on because the first um, the first steps are called the um, mundane steps of the inside the um, lokya that's the mundane steps of inside and then the next steps are the lokutra the super mundane steps of inside so we have three steps, the first one, one, two, three, inside, then the next one, Anicca Dokkanata, and then the third one. And the third one contains some of the mundane and some of the super mundane, and that's the one we're on about now. That's the one that is called abandoning, which means abandoning, in the first place, all negativities. That was the substitution of opposites that belongs in there. And it also means abandoning and defilements, and it means abandoning all wrong view. So with this third one, we have a complete range of insights. We haven't talked about all of them yet, of course. We've only talked about the, the first ones. And it goes from the fifth stage, so we've had four already, from the fifth stage of insight to the ninth one. And in there, we touch upon the super mundane. So the, the first stage where we knew about, it's called the delimitation of mind and matter. What are the limits of mind? What is the limit of matter? To know those limits, to limit them to their function, which is the first step. Then we know the individual nature of all phenomena. We can see that. We know the nature of the mind and we know the nature of the body. And if we don't know it, we've got to look again. And also, what we can see is we know the nature of the elements. That's another thing that happens during that time. We can see that the earth element is something solid, and we can see that the fire element is the temperature. So we can see all the nature, the individual nature of all the things that we investigate. That's the first step to get to have the understanding of the known. Now the known is everything that we can actually put our mind to. But usually, in ordinary life, we put our mind to those things which we want to know because we hope to get a pleasant feeling from them. Now sometimes, of course, we're mistaken. We don't get a pleasant feeling. So we often blame somebody else because we didn't get that pleasant feeling. And sometimes we blame ourselves because we didn't do it right. But we could know all these things all the time because they're constantly available to us. We could know the elements and their function. We could know the function of mind and matter all the time if we were to put our mind in that direction. But other than in a meditation course, when one is pushed against that with, with um, through the talks and, and through one's own uh, wish to do it, one doesn't usually put one's mind there. So the, that which is true escapes us all the time because we don't put our mind in that direction. Okay. 
So then the next thing, the investigation that we can do, means that we look into the three uh, characteristics. And we look into that through everything that we can experience. Again, we see that it is individual, but also general. So now we can go from that known through ourselves, we can go to that which is universal. And that investigation, so we can see now, we cannot see that the universe is contracting and expanding. But because everything within us is constantly moving and impermanent, and we know that that is so, because that the scientists have already investigated that, we can connect the two. So here we have now the universality, also because we know our own dukkha and we know where it comes from and it doesn't mean tragedy it just means this constant oppression that we have we know that everybody else got it too we don't have to sit in the other person we can sit inside ourselves become aware of what's going on in there and we know everything around us now that's the second stage the knowledge through investigation because now the mind is sharper because of the meditation and can connect it connects to everything around it so we have the 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 internal and the external we can see that and for the impermanence the dukkha and if we can see in ourselves already that because of this constant impermanence everything moving all the time and because of the unpleasantness of that movement that there can't be any real substance there as an inference not as an experience yet but as an inference we can infer the same about everything else so we now come from the individual to the universal from the microcosm to the macrocosm and that is the way to go it's not from the macrocosm to the microcosm because we don't know what's happening out there but we know what's happening in here and that takes us out there and then we know everything is the same so that's our second, second um, uh, step and then we have the, the third one which we are on now which is the third one which is abandoning and abandoning of course has many implications and the first one of those implications is the substitution of opposites now in this case it not only means a, a substitution for any unwholesome thought or feeling it means substituting our erroneous understanding of the world around us now this is a very important step without that step there is no progression we have to substitute that which we think about ourselves and the world with that the way it really is now by this time the meditation has become I mean by this time I mean by this time in in, in this progression I don't necessarily mean by this time in the course <laughs> I'm talking about here in this progression um, by that time the mind is sharp enough to recognize the truth and not be bothered with its own wishes and its own preconceived views and its own defilements and its own hindrances and its own blockages and its uh, and all the rest of the stuff that's going on but it knows the truth and because it knows the truth it gently and little by little substitutes that what it has always thought with something else the way it has seen things up to then now this is a very important step this substitution step and and it actually starts with this next insight that we get this 
when we, when we substitute our erroneous notions about ourselves in the world. And the next step is this, the seeing of the dissolution. But before we get to that, we have to see a few other things. Now we had already the arising and ceasing at steps as step two, but that has to be deepened now. The arising and ceasing of everything that we can put our mind to. Our thoughts, our meditation subject, our feelings, our body, everything that we can possibly direct the mind to. The movement that comes about through the wind outside the movement that comes about in our own body. Nothing is stationary. So now the rising and ceasing has to deepen. It has to deepen and mature, it's called. It becomes mature. And that is the stage of feeling it. Until then, we could know it. It was quite all right to know it. Now we've got to feel it. We've got to feel it that there is no solidity in this mind and body phenomena. That it is a constant flux. And of course, in a course, in a meditation course such as this, this is quite um, the thing that we can come to grips with. Because if we just look at the day, how it goes from moment to moment to moment, change change, 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 nothing to hang on to. Yesterday, gone. Day before, all gone, 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 gone. Constantly gone. So as we deepen our understanding of rising and ceasing, we still again look at the five aggregates and we again and again see their impermanence, but we also see the dukkha embedded in that. Because the five aggregates are our most influential insight supports. Because they're us. That's all we are. Five aggregates. So investigating them in the view of their constant change and the dukkha embedded in that. Because it's not, if it's really nice, Lovely. It's jhana. We can't stay there either. And because of that, where is the solidity within them? Where is the core substance? Okay, that's one investigation. The other investigation is seeing it from morning to evening. With that, we come to an investigation which is twofold. There is, for instance, the first one, birth, decay, and death. Now, we all know we were born, and we all know we're decaying, and we all know we're dying. But this is a much, much deeper investigation, namely, the birth of each thought, then the staying of the thought, and then the death of the thought. And the birth of a feeling, the moment of staying there and its death. The same with the breath. With the breath, maybe not so difficult. Sometimes the middle part one is very difficult to see, that it's staying there. But the arising and the ceasing, not so difficult. But now it's very important also to see all three. Breath starts, middle, end. Starts, middle, end starts, middle, end, again, and again. Every day starts, middle, end. Every moment starts, middle, end. Nothing else except starts, middle, end. All going around in circles. Now this birth, decay, and death, which we had in the five daily recollections, and which is an important factor to know about oneself, now gets deepened through the understanding that every single moment is like 
the moment arises, stays and goes, stays and goes. It's not possible to say it fast enough. It goes so fast. So that this is an, an investigation where the arising and ceasing becomes so um, in such becomes comes such depth that we begin to feel it all the time. And as we feel it and put our attention on that, there is no room for sadness or regret about it. There's just a feeling of knowing, of really being there in the moment. That's why at that time also mindfulness becomes very clear. Now obviously when the meditation is uh, concentrated, that's a good, big help for that. But no matter what, investigation it's called, investigation of, investigate that. That's the most important thing. So what we are looking at before we can go any further to the next step, which is a dissolution which we know, we have to get into the depth of arising and ceasing. And again, we will use the um, we will use the five aggregates as one of our main sources of investigation. But we can also use our daily happening and come down to one moment of it and see a rising, staying, ceasing in that. That will give us a feeling for it. And when we feel that we are constantly moving, because we know all know it, we just don't put our mind to it, then we have completed that particular investigation. The feeling of impermanence within. Now if we feel impermanent, we are getting near to actually recognizing the fact that this is a guest performance and we are getting near to the realization that It's all a passing show. The whole thing is a passing show, from moment to moment. And as it is a passing show, what is there to get upset about? What is there to worry about? What is there to want? It's just passing, isn't it? It is as if one is sitting in a moving train and thinks oneself quite stationary and the whole landscape is moving by very fast. In actual fact, the landscape is moving at all. It's, it's a train that's moving and w which one is sitting. And this is what we're doing. We're sitting in this train and we're moving very fast from birth to death. And we're taking everything that we that happens while we're sitting in that train moving very fast towards its destination, we're taking every little bit very seriously. And we think it's all something that is happening to us. And matter of fact, it's just the scenery going by. That's all. So if we were to pay attention to the scenery going by, then we mightn't feel so terribly solid. But this is the way we always feel. We feel that we are solid and everything else is moving. But it's we are moving. And so if we get that clear, then all this stuff that's going by, well, yeah, so sure, it's there, but it's going. Going, going, gone. At this point, the investigation should be from moment to moment. It's a moment to moment investigation where we can recognize the impermanence or we can't, we're either way. If we put our mind one-pointed to it, nobody will fail to recognize it. 
It's impossible not to recognize it. The only reason we don't have it within our inner repertoire is because we don't put our mind on it. That's all. We think everything else is more important. What we like and what we don't like, where we get pleasant feelings from, how we're going to be important, how we're going to be appreciated, loved, cared for, God knows what else we think. But we certainly don't put our attention on that every moment is passing by. So wherever we put our mind, we will know it. We are such intelligent creatures, that's why we think we're something else, we're, we're really something special. But in reality, we're not putting it where it should be. It says the high road of insight knowledge begins with that knowledge of arising and passing away. So one has, though the meditator should be especially acquainted with this particular knowledge and requires a thorough understanding of the three characteristics, Anicca Dukkha Natta. So having that kind of uh, understanding really is sort of like a turning point. That's a turning point where the mind uh, recognizes that it has been under a delusion all the time and that has used its time in this life uh, wastefully. Wasted it on things which are totally immaterial, unimportant, and seeing things moving by like in a, in a speeding train Everything moving all the time. One sees oneself moving like that, fast like that. Then the whole thing has a different connotation. This is a very important point. So this point which is being made here is to see a rising, staying, ceasing in each moment, each aggregate each happening and then also another investigation which will could be helpful is to see the cause for the arising and the cause for the dissolution now what is the arising for instance if we look at something and see a bird the cause for that is the seeing contact, the sense contact, right? Then from that sense contact comes the perceiving and then we can say, I like the bird or whatever it is we're saying. So we have a cause. And what's the ceasing of it? The ceasing is because the mind no longer stays with it. The whole thing, the birds disappeared. We're no longer interested, we don't even know the bird's there anymore. It's finished. Now, if that isn't impermanent, I don't know what is. This needs to be inquired into. With that causing of the arising of the mental formation and the cause for the ceasing of the mental formation, the impermanence of it becomes even clearer. It becomes so clear that the next step after that is that we see the dissolution, the ceasing. That the arising and the staying for a moment is no longer the focus of attention. It's the disappearing, the dissolving, which becomes the focus of attention. And that's the next step of insight. Now, the arising and ceasing has to be deepened, but as you remember, it's already was mentioned before. So here, now, in order to get this to the next step, it's a dissolving, the dissolution, how everything dissolves. And we, we get that insight through the deepening of the three moments of everything to be right in the present with it and to get the feel of this movement, to really feel. And then when we feel this movement of arising, staying, ceasing, then the mind 
spontaneously moves towards everything is falling apart the thoughts are disintegrating the feeling is disintegrating the breath is disintegrating the body is disintegrating the day is disintegrating the meditation course is disintegrating everything is disappearing constantly can you hang on to anything? what can we hang on to? There's nothing we can hang on to. The mistaken view comes about because the observer is there saying, aha, it's disintegrating. So I must be the observer. So investigate the observer. Is the observer arising, staying, ceasing? And very often disintegrating? (laughs) Now that is actually that together with the mature knowledge of arising and ceasing the dissolution that is the turning point of insight when that is seen insight has become deep enough to make a difference repeat that for the jhana meditator the best time to do this is after the jhanas because the mind is perfectly malleable, imperturbable, expansive, it has a feeling of uh, acceptance in it, it's not, doesn't have any resistance. For anyone who doesn't do the jhanas, after a concentrated meditation, whatever concentration means for whoever is doing it, then it's the time to do it. So we can say, for instance, that if it is, if one sits for one hour, that one uses the first half for the calm and the second half for the inside. This is just a generality. You can figure out the best way for yourself. But this is, would be a certain way of doing it because the calm mind, the really calm mind, the mind that has been able to go into the jhanas does not have resistance in it because if it had resistance it couldn't have gone into the jhanas so the unresisting mind will accept the reality of this but the doubtful mind the skeptical mind the um, angry mind upset mind sad mind whatever it may be any of these doubtful and skeptical resisting rejecting will say well yeah maybe but and then from but comes the rest of the story the doubtful mind (coughs) is the yes but mind it's a mind that has another thing that it could possibly also investigate what the Buddha explained here about impermanence and anicca dukkanatta and explained over and over and again and again are just facts there's no assumptions in it there's nothing in it that has any uh, with any difficulty in it it's just facts but there are facts and facts of nature laws of nature which we do not pay attention to that's all And once we do pay attention to them and have changed our way of looking at things to that way of looking at things, then, of course, we have an easy passage. Because all our wrong way of looking at it brings all the dukkha. That's where we get all our dukkha from. And whichever way we call that dukkha, it doesn't matter what name we give that dukkha, whether we call it um, fear or uh, doubt or uh, uh, anger or craving, it doesn't matter what we call it, it's all dukkha. It's just plain old dukkha, that's all. Now, what also happens is that If one is becoming aware of the ending of everything, the dissolution of everything, that it becomes 
very automatic that one sees that. And sometimes a meditator may even think that the meditation has suffered a setback may think that uh, because it's an automatic understanding that everything is dissolving and the mind says, oh, well, it's it's always dissolving and nothing else happens, just the realization of the dissolving but no no influence or no result from that. But that's not so. That's not a, a setback in meditation. On the contrary, it's a very, a strong insight and one just has to persevere with it and the mind will take its clue from that. Sometimes people even get fed up with the meditation because it appears to be uh, mechanical. They can see, oh yes, everything is coming and going, yes, everything is going, and they feel like mechanical about it, and they get fed up with it. But that's not, uh, that's not a cause for despair. On the contrary, at that time, the mind is very pinpointed on each moment, whereas before that, it could see the whole thing, just like our mind is usually very diffuse we react to seeing and hearing and touching to react to all these things and it's almost all at once we are, our minds are not one pointed in our daily lives but here the mind has become very one pointed seeing this dissolving and at that time it is a, a very important step and the mind is in, in, um, in very good shape actually And at seeing that dissolution like that, whatever it is, the breath going away, the thought, the attention on the breath disappearing, the, um, the jhana state disappearing, each one disappearing, every movement we make, everything's disappearing. At that time, we lose the sense of compactness. Now, having seen arising and ceasing, the impermanence that flux and flow has become um, a feeling, an inner reality. And now this compactness goes away. We, when we sit here like this, everybody feels pretty solid, huh? and uh, with exact outline, and uh, knowing exactly this is me. There's no doubt about it got to be me since it's not you it's got to be me so there's no question and uh, it's um, a very solid feeling even though inside there may be flutters of fear and anxiety and worry and all sorts of things yet this sort of feeling which is very much body based but mentally um, noted is very compact But at the time when we become aware of dissolution over and over and over, then this compactness is no longer the same. The mass feeling, it's like a mass, this is a solid mass. We can feel that this is all, well, like blips, electrical impulses. The mind is electrical impulses, but the body is too. And with the the mind going in that direction, this whole solidity gets shaken. Now this is a very important point. This goes then already towards the um, super mundane. Because all these steps of dissolution go towards the experience of non-self. So, but they have to be so embedded in our inner feeling that we are quite able and willing 
to let go of self. Of course, having noted that self is always making dukkha for us, it may be very helpful, but it's not enough. We also have to realize that letting go of self, there's really nobody to let go of. It's just a mind-made fantasy that we're letting go of. It's that Alice in Wonderland who thought she was really tiny, small, and then she was really big. (coughs) It's all mind-made fantasy. That's all we're letting go of. Because if we were to let go of self, well, wouldn't that be a tragedy? Because then we'd lose everything, wouldn't we? But what we're really losing is just a delusion. And with that delusion gone, that's a totally different uh, feeling within. So what we're losing is this mass and also this compactness which we feel here that it's continue, continued that continuity now we have a memory of ourselves what we looked like before and what we look like now and we can look in the old photo albums and see what we used to look like and it's all me So, because we remember all that, there's continuity. And this continuity makes it appear as if it's really so. We have that appear, it has that appearance of as if this me idea is true. But when the disillusion is noted over and over again, then we realize that there is no continuity. It's all coming together and falling apart, coming together and falling apart all the time. And the whole of continuity is also an illusion. And just because we were angry yesterday and are angry again today doesn't mean that we're always angry. And just because we were a person ten years ago and had a certain, or let's say 20 years ago, and had a certain, looked in a certain way, doesn't mean we look the same way now. All you have to do is look at a photo from 20 years ago and you'll be quite surprised. Looks quite different. So that continuity is all an illusion. And when we realize this coming and going, coming and going, will also get rid of the idea that the things that have happened to us in this life have to be perpetuated in our mind. That's the only place we are perpetuating everything. We don't have to. We can let it all go because none of it is coming together and falling apart now. It's just what we put in our mind. So the continuity also comes up as an illusion, just as this mass is an is an illusion. Then, and when we when we see that, we can see that these are concepts that we have put into our mind, and concepts are actually something that has a stability about it because we can bring up the same concept over and over again and with that concept stability we have found ourselves something that we can hang on to because we feel very insecure if we have nothing to hang on to in reality there is nothing more secure than letting go of everything because then what is there to be done? Everything is okay, it's fine. It's all flowing away anyway. And as long as one isn't fully enlightened, all one has to watch out for is not to make bad karma, that's all. It's so simple. Of course, fully enlightened doesn't make bad karma. Anyway, it doesn't make any karma. So, the, the concept which we have made about ourselves is a whole storyline. I'm male or female, beautiful or ugly, intelligent or stupid, rich or poor, 
skillful or unskillful, wholesome or unwholesome, uh, humorous or uh, dry, uh, the um, uh, charismatic or uh, uninteresting, boring. Uh, the whole gamut of everything and we've got the whole thing set up and that's me and then of course doctor, lawyer, baker, candle maker and all the rest of it <laughs> and, uh, uh, and mother, father, sister, brother uh, unhappy, happy, uh, doubtful and the, all that and this is a nice square concept and we fit into that because we make ourselves fit into this nice little concept there. It's a box and we're going to live in this box. And it doesn't matter how much dukkha that box makes for us. It's me. And within that me, all these concepts are accepted as reality. But the Buddha says, look in a different way. Don't look there. Don't look at that. That you are all of those things. Look that everything is passing away, dissolving. Watch every moment go by. We've been sitting here and sitting here and Sydney, sitting here. Now 18 days are gone by. Finished. All gone. So, could we have kept them? because we didn't get a good meditation on the third day, could we do the third day over? <laughs> no way. Impossible. Can't do anything. It just goes and goes and goes. We can't do anything over. But we can notice this moment. So, if we actually have that understanding that we are conceptualizing all the time, we can look into reality. And the reality is this, this um, that we see that we are having a concept about continuity, we're having a concept about this mass, that this is a mass. And we have also sort of a concept about the function of this what this is supposed to accomplish, this thing that we call me. And we have a, this is a, a function that needs to be, um, which we have set up ourselves. And that's where this uh, achievement syndrome comes from. We've set this all up ourselves. That um, we make up a concept, now this is, a, I'm a, a intelligent human being and uh, I have to be able to um, understand the whole Dhamma or I have to be able to make a lot of money or I have to be able to uh, uh, be liked by lots of people or I have to be able to I don't know what else people think they have to be able to do this and that and the other this concept of the function that we have each one has a concept about that I'm a healer I'm a meditator I'm a, a intelligent uh, uh, person, I'm spiritual, I'm uh, the, whole, the whole thing, the achievement, what we're going to do. There's nothing to do, absolutely nothing. When you see all these blips, that everything is coming and going, and particularly when it's going, what's all these blips supposed to achieve? They're all going to die, for sure. It says here quite an interesting uh, uh, paragraph. I'll read that. Huh? In everyday life, people depend on a multitude of concepts of conventional origin. When the perception of compactness disintegra disintegrates, conventional notions also break up. One is be beginning to move from the fiction believed by the deluded to the truth seen by the noble ones. Whatever monks has been pon now this is now comes the words of the Buddha, okay? The first was only the description, now come the words of the Buddha. Whatever monks has been pondered over as truth by the world with his gods and maras, by the progeny consisting of recluses and brahmins, gods and men, 
that has been well discerned as untruths by the noble ones, noble ones are enlightened ones, as it really is with right wisdom. This is one mode of reflecting, and whatever monks has been pondered over as untruths by the world with his gods and maras, that has been discerned as truths by the noble ones, as it really is with right wisdom, this is the second mode of reflection. That's a typical statement of the Buddha. Always first this way and then that way. The double, first the positive, then the negative, or vice versa. So what he's actually saying here is that wherever we put our mind and see this as a truth, this conceptual or truth, fiction it's called, um, as the world sees it, that's all untrue. It's all untrue. And therefore, we have to use these kind of investigating um, modes in order to see the truth. From a practical standpoint, we can use our discerning ability as we watch each moment that goes on during the day and see whether this moment is repeatable. Obviously it isn't. But not just saying, yes, sure, it's not repeatable. Seeing it, doing it oneself, knowing it's not repeatable. Nothing is repeatable. Everything is gone. Seeing the thoughts, feelings, breath, heartbeat, the whole body functions, everything as, as they are, coming together and disappearing. And seeing the disappearance of it all, every, even, not, even the best meditation disappears, gone. Even the best day has disappeared, and of course the worst days too, they all disappear, everything disappears, every moment disappears. And being fully conversant with that and also being conversant with the conceptualizing that we do. The conceptualizing that we do that who we are and who we want to be and who we think we are because of what we think has happened to us. All of those concepts getting every one of them clear in the mind and seeing them for what they are, the storyline, that's all. But why are we making that storyline? We're making the storyline in order to have something where we can put ourselves into a nice little box which says, this is me, these are the borders, these are the, this is the outline and don't anybody come in there, that's me. And what's in there in that box is all fantasy, every bit of it. It has no connection with truth. It's all thought up. Now that, all that, you've got to check up yourself. Check every bit of that. Whether that's all thought up or whether there's any basis in any of that. visitors <laughs> now that will be the deepening of the arising and ceasing and the seeing of the dissolution which changes our viewpoint about ourselves and the best time after the jhanas maybe half and half or after a strong concentrated meditation all right, that's enough on that one. Questions are now in order. Yes. One problem I, I find with watching the dissolution is when I start watching something dissolve, it quits dissolving. It's like I grab it and bring it back. Like what? Give an example. Uh, particularly ideas, things like if it's something physical, such mm. as you know, touch, yeah, I get that, that. Mm. but particularly an idea, particularly sensual desire or ill will, something okay. like that, okay. that 
an attempt to watch it dissolve makes it come back. Right. Um, that's, well, that in itself is already dissolving. But the dissolving is not necessarily that you don't get it back. Mm. Ah, okay. Right? Because, I mean, we're back all the time. Everything falls apart and comes together. We're back all the time. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here. But every single moment, there's birth, decay, and death. And in that decay, that's a period when it stays a moment. So, sure, you get it all back. This is the continuity. Right. That, that continuity illusion that we have. And the mind, or at least my mind, tends to grab for the arising of the next version right. of it, rather than right. seeing the ceasing right. of the current okay. version. Maybe you can change that focus right. of attention and go to the ceasing. Right. Yes. The second thing, someone told me when I mentioned that I was doing jhana practice, this corruption of insight or something like that. That's I right. I don't remember who said it. So obviously, it, somebody around here mm. thinks that's where, that, well. that's why you shouldn't do this. That's right. That's right. I, I'm pretty sure that I thought about it as a little bit more. Where does all this confusion arise from? Because it's so clear what the Buddha said, and not only that, it's so clear what, what everybody experiences. Um, I, I, that's where it comes from. And these are not the Buddha's words, this is commentary. And commentary, the Sudhimaga commentary, which is a very important commentary, and helps a great deal, but gives rise to misunderstanding. Because if, we conceptualize. If it's misunderstood. Yeah, well, it is obviously right. yeah. greatly misunderstood. But what's said there is, you know, yeah. you don't think you're enlightened if you do that. Yeah, if you think you're enlightened, you're doing it wrong. Right. That's all it says. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So might it then be the case that since the teachers don't understand, I mean, it comes from a lack of understood experience, it seems like. Fear. Most likely, because yes. If the teacher does not know the practice, then it has that element of fear, whereas mm. your teacher obviously didn't have that fear because mm. he knew, he had, he had the understood experience, yeah. and so therefore it was real. Well, that's where it comes from. I mean, also that people haven't been taught this. There's another idea that it's very difficult. That's also another idea. And it is very difficult. It's another concept. If we could drop all our concepts, we'd all be enlightened. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is where we, we got this difficulty from. So, anything else? Any other questions? Or quite clear to how to become enlightened, huh? Hmm? Yes, Michael. In the in this uh, progression of steps, does every step have to be perfectly understood and absorbed before going on to the next one, or can you kind of have a, a grasp of an earlier step and be be working on one path? Uh, yes, that happens uh, quite frequently, actually, because we also all have a natural tendency for impatience. Um, but what happens then is that the next step does not become clear, but the one before that comes to maturity. It doesn't really matter which one we work at. The one we haven't quite got together yet is the one that's going to come clear. You see, if arising and passing hasn't come quite clear yet and we're working on dissolution, arising and passing is going to come clear. It's quite okay. So the, the, uh, the, uh, actually the necessity for having a completion of one step is there, but it's a natural progression. It's quite natural. It happens on its own. I was thinking in particular of really being into maybe the dis dissolution phase, but not having a thorough understanding of cause, cause and effect, which is an earlier stage. Hmm. 
maybe then the dissolution will not have the necessary uh, effect. Because if cause and effect is not understood, then dissolution isn't going to bring that that um, um, loss of mass and continuity with it. So it doesn't matter where one puts one's mind, something good is going to come out of it anyway. And it doesn't ha- doesn't necessarily happen in that progression exactly. One doesn't have that necessarily as uh, a knowledge that it's happening like that. But all of them are useful to investigate. And the um, if cause and effect is not quite clear, then the disillusion will not have the real depth of impact, but it will have some impact. And that some impact, again, will have another effect. So every investigation will bring something. Anything else? Yes. I have a question about the arising, the... um uh, enduring and the dissolving of of the known dharma, because you talked about it kind of being lost and then being rediscovered by the Buddha and having a certain kind of duration during which time it's more known than oh, not, yes. mm-hmm. and then there is going to, and then there is a ceasing of it, mm. and and within that, of course, there are many arisings and ceasings going on of that and I was and I was wondering I was having this feeling about I guess the importance of grasping this opportunity for us now and the fact and, and a kind of some kind of a real like impersonal sense about the Dharma hmm. that it's like a kind of a phenomenon or something and I, I think I don't understand I was wondering if you would like what do you mean that that the teaching is a phenomenon well, the teaching, sure. emerging, the teaching is exists as a truth, but it is it's emerging it, it's emerging as a phenomenon or something mm. because we are all participating in it, and, mm. and but then it is also dissolving in a kind of a longer pattern back into whatever to then be rediscovered and reemerge. And yeah, well, each Buddha has to re rediscover the four noble truths and the Noble Eightfold Path for himself. But That's then, why he's called a Buddha. But then that means that the, that the, that there is a sense of the existence of that which is contained in a knowing, oh. or that can be known through phenomena. Yeah, that but I mean, does that make any big difference whether we get enlightened or not? No. We better get enlightened now. Huh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, I think I came to this more from the feeling of like the urgency or the Urgency, that's right. That's right. Urgency is a is a factor on the path. It's called some vega and it's very important. Because without that one is you know, one has the uh, tendency to procrastinate. And my teacher says procrastination is the thief of time. Steals our time. So uh, we all have that tendency. It's very human tendency and the urgency is the antidote please put the attention on the breath for just a few moments Think of that which constitutes the greatest happiness for you that you know. And then feel that happiness.
whatever it is that brings the greatest happiness let it enter into your heart and be with it experience it become that happiness And then see how you can protect it. Think of the person sitting nearest you here. Wish for that person to protect his or her happiness. And commit yourself to helping to protect it for that person. Now think of everyone here and wish that everyone can protect his or her own happiness and commit yourself to helping to protect it, no matter what that happiness may be. Now think of your parents. Think of what their happiness may be. Wish them to protect it and you to help protect their happiness. Feel committed caring and loving so that there is protection for them. Think of those people who are nearest and dearest to you. Think of what their happiness may be. Wish them to protect it. And with your care and your love for them, to help them. Now think of all your friends.
think of what their happiness would be. Wish for them that they can keep it and that your care and love and friendship will help them to keep their happiness. Think of all the people you know, those that come to mind. That have a place in your life. Wish for them that they may have happiness and keep it. Let your love and care help them. Commit yourself to that. reaching out to them think of anyone whom you find difficult wish for that person too to have happiness and to keep it. Let your caring and loving heart reach out to help that person to have and keep happiness. Think of all the people who live in this place and come to visit us and work here. Wish them happiness to have and to keep. Reach out to them, wanting to help them keep happiness in their hearts. Think of all the people in Oakland, those you might have seen on the street, in the shops, or those you just know that live in Oakland. Let your mind reach out to know all the people in the houses, in the shops, on the street. Wish them to have happiness to be able to protect it and let your heart reach out to them caring and loving wanting to help
think of people who particularly need to have a little happiness in their hearts and lives. We should for them reach out to them, loving, caring and helping. Let your own heart, which contains happiness, grow and expand to share with as many beings as you can touch. Letting happiness flow from your heart to theirs. Put your attention back on yourself and feel the happiness in your heart that comes from caring, loving, helping and sharing. Let it fill your heart. 